Welcome to the Success Journey Show. Let's travel together through the lives of individuals on the road to success. Yo, what's going on, everyone? It's Ricky Venters and Marlon. Wooka Wooka Madden. And we are <laughs> back with you <laughs> for another episode of the Success Journey Show. What's going on? What's going on, everyone? <laughs> <laughs> you oh, remember man. back in the day when you really listened to when the radio when we, everyone used to be on the radio you sitting by there pressing record on your uh on your tape to record yeah. the different songs that are come on man you'll stay there for hours it's like yes you would oh, go to get rid of boom <laughs> da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah pause it right at the right time at yep. the song and then press record again with the next song man take that tape out throw it in your car or your your this man and you're good to go, man. <laughs> man, people got it good these days, dude. Yeah, man. People got it good these days. Um, let, let me good, tell man. you, Rick. Um, yo, I'm so I'm so I'm so, I'm just so happy for um, you know, the biggest thing that we talk about here on the on the success journey show, and we show the the journey of somebody's success, but we also talk about that synergy, mind, body, and spirit. And if those three are not aligned or parallel or however you want to put it, you're going you're gonna to fall in one area. And your life all is going to be, um, everything is going to be, it's going to pay as a, if your spiritual is not on, if your mind is not on. If you're, so we, 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 we're here at Success Journey Show. We're really trying to push that because society, we're not, we're not pushing that mindset, mindset. Grind, 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 grind. But don't remember to, you know, um, enjoy where you're at. Enjoy the different things you're doing. Enjoy your successes. Even sometimes us, Rick, we don't enjoy yeah. our success. We we, yeah. we we do a big thing, and we don't even see it as a big thing. We just no, say, oh, no, we're there. oh, man, okay, next. Next. Yeah. <laughs> next. I was thinking about that this morning. I was walking, and I was just thinking about, um, you know, not putting that pause in in place, and I and I don't know if it's a fear of of missing out or losing out on the the your your big picture goal that you have in front of you. But you know, I've seen people, man. They are as happy as they can be, and they they ain't got they ain't got nothing. nothing. You know what I mean? Like they 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 are <laughs> yeah. happy as they. Can be they're smiling at you, they're wishing them a call it. Yeah, they can't go here, they can't go there, but they're just happy people. And I'm just like, man, now you need to do some more work. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I, I, I got I got goals, man. I gotta get to this place. I gotta do this, I gotta do that. Then I then I'll be, then I'll be happy. Sometimes like then I'll be happy once I obtain it. But when you get fall into that trap of you know, not pausing, not reflecting, and that's what I started doing is more I start really reflecting, like yo, just. Um, this last week, just gratitude, like yo, gratitude, like just being in that mode of gratitude, really reflecting on all the different things that I have and the Lord has blessed us with. Um, and just being in that place of like, wow, like yo, thank you. You know, if I don't if I don't do anything else, man, like you have really, God, you have really just given me an amazing life, you know. And yep. I just want to I want to cherish that, you know. So yep. yeah, it, it's a uh and, and I got to be careful. I don't project that on the kids, right? Yeah. So talking to my son, he, um, he's been on a journey this year. You know, he got cut from a, 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 a tribal basketball team after he's been playing, after he was playing basketball for like all but a, 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 like two months prior to that. Like, and he got cut from yeah. a tribal team. It cut him to the core because he thought, you know, he can get right on there. And so this whole year, he's just been like playing basketball, all different levels, just to try to, go back out for that team next year. That, that's his goal, to go back out for the team and hopefully make it. And he said something to me this week. He was like, man, I don't, I don't want to be on a, a, um, playing at a certain level anymore. Mm. And, I mean, we had the conversation of, hey, you start something, you finish it. Yeah. Right? So, you know, you have, a, you, have, you have a responsibility to finish what's in front of you right now. But then at the same time, I told him, I said, but – it doesn't mean that you have to stay in it forever. Yeah. You realize it's not what you want to do. That's cool, right? 
I don't want you to lose the joy of bas- basketball, whatever it may be, because you get into an environment that you just really don't want to don't want to be in, right? And that's okay, you know. And I had to really just sit there and tell him like, "Yo, dude, that's okay." And 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 other times I probably would have been if I wouldn't really think I would have probably been like, "Oh no, man, you got to do it, man. Like, you got to want to be the best. You got to be around the best, man. You got to go out there." Yeah, yeah. But guess what? You don't have to be the best at basketball. Dude, you really don't have to. You know, no. if that's not where you want to go, by all means, we don't have to go there. Yeah. Let's find your lane. Let's find what you want to do for yourself. Yeah. And, um, you know, just having that realization, even with him, and not make sure I'm not transferring onto him, like, oh, no, you got to go achieve that. You want to go, you got to do this, you got to do this. Like, no, nah, no. Nah. Find what you want to do, man, and we'll support you and push you along. So, man, guys, that's just a whole bunch of, preliminary talk to set you up for this episode yes sir because the guest that we have coming to you in a minute is getting ready to blow your mind um before we go there just remember to always check us out on on our website on any podcast listening platform share leave a review um shoot us an email about people you want us to interview uh and then also you know you can go to if you're into internet radio we're on there as well, right? Check us out on there, iHeart21.6, the net. Uh, and we have a, a few more coming uh, to you. So really appreciate you guys tuning in with us today. And we know you're going to love this episode. All right, travelers. All right. We have come to the our favorite segment of this show. And that's when we bring on a guest to uh, just come and chat with Marlon and myself about their life, about their journey. And uh, we have none other than Wiley McGraw with us today. Wiley, thanks so much for being with us on the Success Journey Show. Guys, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. It's an honor um, just to have you in our presence and get the behind the scenes story um, to your journey, you know, to where you are right now. Uh, I mean, we, we have a lot in store for all the travelers, you know, uh, Wiley, he has a, a very di- a dynamic background uh, and I can't wait to jump into it. So Wiley, why don't you start off by just sharing with our travelers uh, just a, a little bit about yourself. Get, let them know who Wiley is. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> I'll do everything in my power to make it nice and truncated and very valuable for them to to learn a little bit about my background so they can make sense of what we're going to talk about. But um uh, I'm currently the founder of Radical Performance Acceleration, and it is, it's a specific customized uh, business for high achieving leaders, uh, prominent influential people, and has been for almost 14 years now. But uh, starting back to where I came from, um, I was groomed as a star athlete uh, from the young age of five years old. Baseball was my primary focus. Of course, I played football and soccer and kind of did the whole uh, you know, the gamut of those different types of sports, but baseball was a primary focus. My father was a semi-pro ball player. Um, pitching was my forte. And as I got older, the talent was recognized and cultivated and was pushed. And it was driven into me to be my best every single time I took the mound. And as I got older and I played the game year in and year out, I fell in love with it more and more. But I started to realize there was an internal uh, battle that was uh, starting to wage within me about why I was playing the game, what stress was that I was under during my performance. And I started to find myself pulling away from it because of the, I would say, external pressures to be perfect as this star pitcher. Uh, I was being trained by, you know, the, the pros uh, as a young a young man. I was being introduced to people like Bo Jackson and Mickey Mantle and Rod Crew. So I was always around these really prominent people that really expected me to be my best. So I was always playing for their expectations more so than just my love of my my game itself. And as I I grew up and got older, I started to realize that battle and I found myself wanting more and realizing that this was not enough for me. Playing the game for the expectations of others outside of me, the, the unnecessary stress that was placed upon me that if I did not perform to what they wanted, I was always punished or reprimanded for it and I was pushed even harder. I found that to be a detriment to who I was as a human being, as a young man. So I found myself being enticed by more, I would say, um, challenging worlds that started to show up around me. And that's where I found the love of bull riding 
and I became a competitive bull rider in the world of rodeo. And I found that this world was this unique, holistic, aggressive, more uncontrollable environment that really challenged me to step up and become more of the man I wanted to be. It introduced me guys to a, a version of myself. You know, I talk about this constantly that really ignited uh, the, this inner beast that I've been waiting to meet. And it really started to feel that potential of mine rattle from within that was being suppressed by the hyper-focused skill of baseball and the perfectionism that was expected of me. And I got excited and turned on by that every time I went to a rodeo and every time I rode, sitting on the back of this 1,500 pound, 2,000 pound wild animal, I was forced to be present, focused, in tune with my emotions and my mind and my gut and unaware of the fear of the unknown what could happen. I learned how to yield to that fear so that my potential could be actualized and can be completely monumental for my success as a bull rider. Mm -hmm. And I just started this journey on wanting to know more about myself in challenging environments and situations. So I pushed on beyond that after I think a half a decade of competitive bull riding, I got into, you know, joined the military and became a combat infantryman with the 101st Airborne Division, did three tours overseas, and it was in the throes of war that I truly started to discover this innate gift that I had been born with, this superpower, if you will, where I could see, experience, and feel blind spots and stress in people's performance. I knew exactly when and how and where to push and, and, and pull back, et cetera, to optimize team function, team performance, mindset development, et cetera. And, um, you know, I achieved um, great things in the military, but I got out and started to chase that path of self-mastery. I wanted to discover more about myself as a human being holistically versus the compartmentalization that we are taught to uh, operate from, where it's all about, you know, focusing on mindset only and trying to achieve success from a monetary standpoint or some form of growth or scale. And then we tend to, especially as men, right, we are told to suck it up and deal with it and sweep all of those you know, uncomfortable, unnecessary things that we shouldn't give attention to under the rug and hope that, you know, down the road, it doesn't affect us. But for me, I, I realized that at a young age, that was hindering my performance. So I just started down this nice, beautiful, intense, very uncomfortable path of really understanding who I was without all the stress and sacrifice and discomfort that I had been accustomed to carrying around with me. And after I got out of the military, I uh, pursued that first and foremost. And then I built my business now, Radical Performance Acceleration, around my unique approach to human performance uh, from the inside out, fully integrated into someone's life to truly radically up-level them to their highest levels of potential and performance. And I started with combat veterans and PTSD. I started working with them and getting them out of their PTSD symptoms, off their medications. They were sleeping better at night. And we were doing it so quickly that the VA started to take notice. And I started to meet people at these different conferences and events. And then from there, it just it birthed into this referral based behind the scenes secret uh, weapon, if you will, uh, for doctors, lawyers, uh, public figures, pro athletes, and so forth. And that's where I'm at now talking to you and sharing, you know, this unbelievable journey, but also um, the philosophies that I discovered through these life experiences that were very intense, very revealing and understanding and seeing the gap that exists right now in our personal development, our high performance landscape and our leadership development industries and why people are always on this constant struggle and grind to figure out what's next, why they're not getting where they want to be right now, um, and why they're just settling for the idea that it's just part of life. It's just the cost of being human or doing business that you have to be stressed, that you have to cope, and you have to just suck it up and deal with it. And I'm here to say, if you want to, especially if you want to be a leader in your life, and you want to understand where the real battlefields are and where the real enemy exists and how it actually it, it, it hinders who you are and what it takes to be a warrior for your life in your business. Then it's all about jumping into the trenches and facing down those so-called demons so you can become your best. And that's what I did. And that's why I do what I do now for leaders. Oh man, I love it. I love it. It's so much packed in here. I told you guys, it was a, a dynamic story. I, I mean, uh, finally, I can just imagine your name is ar already so befitting as a rodeo, uh, uh, <laughs> in the rodeo, I was like, oh, Wiley McCall. I was like, oh man, like you were born to do this, man. Uh, <laughs> so they, uh, no, one thing I noticed about, um, I've been noticing over the last few months, just individuals that, you know, had the role of, you know, spe especially pitchers, um, other captains of different sports, 
Mm-hmm. It, there's like a, hmm, there's like a presence that you have. Um, and it's like a, a confidence that, mm-hmm. that you have. Um, and as you take on other tasks, that confidence kind of travels with you um, and you find success in those other er- other ventures and other areas. Uh, and I've just been noticing that about, particularly about pitchers and baseball, uh, uh, different captains, some other sports. Um, when you decided to pull away from baseball, you know, and, and, you, and you said your father was a, a big uh, proponent of, hey, man, you, you're here, you're going, you're doing this. Um, you know, supporting you all the way, pushing you all the way, introducing to the different people, the network to give you the opportunities. And you said, Hey, you know what? That's I'm done. I'm I'm shifting to another direction. What was that conversation like? And, you know, (laughs) you know, what what you got, you got to share with us what transpired, you know, what was the aha moment that night or that morning around the dinner table? I don't know where it was, you know, but, you know, to share that with us. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, it wasn't any particular moment. Uh, I think it was a, um, a amalgamation of many moments with um, his his witnessing my rebellion against what I was being expected to be as a pitcher. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to go back and share with you because you made a good point. When you're in these positions, you know I was hyper focused and very grounded in being a great pitcher and I loved playing the game don't get me wrong there are days where I sit back and go, you know sometimes I really do miss those opportunities that I had and I there there was a path to uh college ball uh, with scouts and then eventually the pros I, I know if that that's where I would have put all my energy into it that there's no doubt I could have made it but I'm looking at and in remembering and recalling that intense experience of being a pitcher and being not only great at what I was doing but finding the truth that I was playing it and working to be perfect, not because I expected myself to constantly rise that that next level of performance personally, but I was doing it because I was expected for, for, by someone else outside of me to do it. it. It that fractured that ability to really appreciate the unbelievable talent that I had, and it did not allow me to feel like I was doing something for myself. It was almost as if I was thrown into that sport at a very young age because my father was a semi-pro ball player, because he recognized the talent at a three or four years old and saw my arm. And, you know, my, my dad had the arm as well. And he almost got drafted in the pros in the seventies because he had a cannon of arms. So when he saw that with me, it was like, I'm going to, I didn't do it for myself. So I'm going to do it for, with, with my son. So at the end of the day, what it came down to was I just found myself pulling away naturally. And I just allowed that to happen. And it, it eventually just started to gnaw away at the relationship of playing with my father. And it, that it became this, this point of contention where if I didn't break free from that, I was never going to truly understand what I was capable of creating my own thing and going and exploring something I found for myself that I was attracted to, that I started on my own, that I wanted to accomplish for myself. And that's why bull riding was so holistically different than baseball because I took the skills I learned as, a, as an athlete, as a baseball player, and I brought them into the world of bull riding, but bull riding took me beyond that. It forced me to be completely focused, grounded, and centered on every aspect of who I was. It wasn't just ride a bull and you're done. There were so many different components to um, yielding to the fear of the unknown because you can get hurt. You could die. There's so many different elements there, but you don't really let those dissuade you because you're so connected to the excitement and the joy of being able to experience that short period of time on the back of this wild animal that not many people get to do. And it really makes you feel alive. And to me, that is where I found that solace internally. I started to realize there's so much more of who I am at a very young age. What else is possible if I continue down this path versus feeling stuck over here doing it because somebody else wants me to do it a certain way. So that conversation got to the point where um, it was not really widely accepted that I wanted to do that and I didn't care and I did it anyway. And I found that, um, it, you know, most people that will tell you you can't do something or you shouldn't do something don't really have your best interest, even at the most unconscious of levels, even though consciously they might be saying it because they can see or they might be thinking that this might be a bad decision or that you might not fully get what you're looking for. But I have found that to be very limiting. And I find that today to be limiting when people project what they think 
or know to be true about someone else's life experience and allowing them to go uncover what they're capable of in those intense experiences so they can succeed what makes sense for who they are, not what the world around us expects of us. So that just really became a, I would say a more amoebic kind of transition. It wasn't one conversation or another. Yeah, and, I yeah, yeah. It, and then eventually got to the point where I want to get out completely and I joined the military. Wow. Yeah, uh, yeah very eloquent guy, um, Wiley. But in, in in just a few words, you are a adrenaline junkie. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I I know that that is a common common reaction to hear these things because yeah, even now for almost eight years, I've been jumping out airplanes as a hobby as well. So yeah, yeah. I, I will tell you this: it's not it's not even the the adrenaline is always going to be there. Don't let anybody ever fool you. We we do what we do, especially in the sky. The bull riding was because of the way you feel in the moment, it really does cease every other area of your life. Every other thing going on stops in those brief moments. Skydiving is the same way. You're completely present. You're completely focused on what you're doing in that moment. You're jumping with bigger groups of people. You're team focused so that everybody completes that skydive safely. Same thing with bull riding. It's eight seconds to cover a bull. You're done. You go sit down and you reflect on all the different elements of where you're at. How can you improve? What, what moments did you notice where your performance was slacking or where it was really good. And the thing translates to all these different sports. So the adrenaline is there, but for me, I find it to be more a um, unleashing of what life typically demands of us and allows me to be free in these moments. And I feel like the more consistently we allow ourselves to feel and connect to that aspect of who we are, the more capability we're able to uncover and the more our power, our potential can be unleashed. But until we unchain ourselves and have resources that can put us in those types of environments that are really intense, really challenging, really adrenaline, really adrenaline pushing for you, truly. Um, and you never really get to the full state of like, unconditional vulnerability. You're never really going to optimize and unleash all of who you are. And you're always going to feel like it's just this trickle effect trying to figure out what's next and grind to get to the next uh, chapter of your life. So that's why I love those sports. It's just part of the amalgamation of my life experiences of why it's so exciting to be a part of it. And I'm not saying everybody needs to go jump out of an airplane, but I have like people finding very intense, challenging experiences that really shake them up and shock them a little bit more. Yeah, I'm with you. You want to jump out of the airplane, man? We had a a date scheduled, and this guy over here is a marine. You know, he kind of backed out on me. So I, you know, it's a uh, I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked, you know. But the hey, other you know, way around, time, we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get it next time. We'll get it next time. <laughs> I don't know if we get together, and I'll throw you both out of an airplane. One, it works. Oh yeah, yes, hey, uh, definitely. Um, you know, what made you want to join the military? That's one question. And secondly, of course, your MOS was uh, infantryman, or and then of course you became airborne. Um, so. You know, you're, you're you're the guy kicking in doors, getting shot at and shooting at people, jumping out airplanes and stuff like that in the military. How did that foster your leadership and how did that um, help you to transition that when you got out and form your own company? Because some things that um, and we're going to expound a little bit more, because some things that you talk about, the 40 people behind the one person, that's kind of like the, you know, behind every infantryman, there's at least 40 people to support him or whatever. So definitely want to hear about that transition. And what was your mindset? Yeah, great. Two-part question there. Why did I want to join the military? That was the first one you asked? Yes, sir. It just felt, uh, it felt like the next big step that I needed to take from the world of bull riding. It was this internal conversation I had where I wanted to seek out more wild sides of myself and more challenging situations that can push me further than I'd already been pushed. I wanted mm. to be around other people who were driven like that. So mm. and I remember doing a junior Marine Corps program when I was young with my, um, one of my brothers who ended up becoming, an, uh, you know, joining the 75th Ranger Regiment as well. And my youngest brother ended up being a corpsman. So we're very military heavy in my family, but yeah. all that hard and et cetera. And what I, what I found was when we did the junior Marine Corps program at Camp Pendleton, it, we, we fell in love with the structure of it. And we fell in love with the, what it did for you. It made you feel more alive and more, organized and thought and in emotion and intuition, et cetera. And we discussed it for a little while. I remember the conversation, would, what branch do you want to go? And my brother who became a ranger first actually joined the Navy to be a SEAL. And his he trained for, I think, a year and a half, two years, 
to do that. He was built for it. But um, again, you know, a little bit of um, him being a um, all-star running back and a pro re- almost near pro wrestler he kind of blew his knees out. And then the Navy was like, Hey, you can't do that. You know? So he became a Ranger to kind of give them the bird. So anyway, but it was, we had these conversations and what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to jump out of airplanes and go to Ranger school myself. And I want to be able to experience what the army has to offer because they can guarantee me a job. Uh, yeah. I was very turned on by uh, the mortar gun systems. So that's okay. actually what becoming was an indirect fire infantryman or a mortarman. And I played yeah. with one millimeter mortars for about two years. And then I did four years in the 60 section, became a 60 uh, section squad leader. Uh, okay. And then my third deployment to Iraq. Um, and I got, I just realized that the military was truly one of the most challenging environments to really see what you're capable of. And boy, did it deliver. And I got to tell you, um, it, it gave me life experiences at a young age that I'm very grateful for because it helped me develop going into your second part here. It helped me develop an understanding of my own intuitive leadership style. And I remember being a young private at the time and seeing these guys that were above me that were my leaders, I would take great parts of their leadership and remember, you know, those aspects, but I would just disregard the rest that didn't make sense or work for me. And as I became an NCO and got promoted and became a squad leader, I developed through my own intuition and my experience in, in combat, my own style based on who I was and how I could see the performance of my team and what I felt and knew would be the best for our outcomes of our goals and our accomplishments. And that's why we thrived in my, my role as a leader, as, a, as that 60 squad leader. And I was able to really motivate my guys and myself and have this amazing team function together where there was a lot of respect mutually together. Despite my position, they always had a say in the, in the operational orders that we would put down. It was always a group think together, um, but it was always an open dialogue where I could provide them insights to why the performance may be slacking a little bit and they instantly would want to perform it better and they would improve and we would just actually have unbelievable results for it. So to just truncate that, I think the end of the two part question there is I joined because it was, it, to me, was the next evolution as a man where I could be around other people uh, that were looking for that type of real world challenge and war definitely provides that. And I, I feel that war itself, combat, being in the midst of that kind of chaotic environment, finding myself learning quickly how to be eerily calm in the midst of chaos. Yes, sir. To translate that into understanding that when we can manage inner volatility, when while experiencing external volatility, there's nothing that we can't accomplish. And our performance tends to flow much more effortlessly in that regard, even though it might sound counterintuitive. You might hear to say, well, you're in the most chaotic environment. How, does you, how do you flow so well? It's because you're so connected and grounded in the moment that your innate training comes out. You don't have to think about it. You just operate. You just show up. You just Correct. execute. Everything becomes flawless. And then I took those skills and I just built upon them more and more about myself as a human. And I realized that human performance is very dynamic and complex and it is full of different variables that are chaotic that we as a species, that as a society have not really mastered yet. And I wanted to be the one that closed that gap and giving people these insights to understanding why life experiences like this are those are the real pieces to true transformation of human potential and performance. System steps and processes are more like a, what's the, it's kind of like a, not even an add-on it, it's it's almost like a supporting role for your ability to accomplish things in your life so we've got to just backwards we, we try to approach life and compartmentalization and steps process systems and as long as we operate by you know this acronym this way and this rope step over here this way we should achieve success but in, in actuality is we have to focus and flip it on its head and, and say you know what who, what am i capable of in any environment do i know what i who i truly am where is my power and my potential drive from and am I able to manage myself no matter what situation is going on around me? And when I can get to that state to truly speak that truth to myself and perform from that level consistently on a daily basis, then everything that you put together and you add into your life will just be exponential in your ability to grow and achieve your goals. You've been listening to the Success Journey Show. You can check us out on our social media on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Also on our website, thesuccessjourneyshow.com. Enjoy the rest of the show. Rick, I'm going to give you the next two questions if you give me this one. Sure. Man, come on, man. <laughs> you know, you're just hogging the mic, man. So, Go ahead. For me, the, 
I, I'm just putting myself in your your position. You know, in the military, we have a structure. Mm-hmm. Um, um, mm-hmm. Your demand, the demand on you is heavy, and you understand that. So, of course, you have people that we're not going to say everybody in the military out of, you know, we always say we have our 10%. So you have your 10% that will probably buckle under pressure and all this kind of stuff. But for the majority of people, they're, they're operating at the high, that, that, that high optimum, when, when, especially when that pressure is on, you're in the combat zone, which if you're not, even if you're not the guy on the front lines, but you're the guy back on the fob or on the cob, whatever you're, you're at, or on the a big base and you're saying, hey, this is my job and I have to perform, mortars are dropping, whatever the situation is. And we understand that. And then we understand that, okay, I'm here, I'm in Iraq, I'm in Afghanistan, I'm wherever I'm at for, for how many months you're supposed to be there. And then you come back and you're able to switch to the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man guy that's supposed to help everybody back in here. You, um, people are shooting at you before, but now you're just, hey, you're calm. You're, and you're going through different things in your mind because like me, when I come back and I stand behind somebody in the line at a store and I hear them complain about something so simplistic, to me, it irks me when I first come back like, and you guys don't know how good you have it here. How do you, how did you cope with first saying to someone, when someone comes to you with a problem and you're like, brother, that's not really a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how yeah. do you cope with that in that transition? Because for me, it, it, it'll be, I, I deal with civilians, sorry to say, with, with, not now you guys are, are diseased, but we call them civilians. Uh, I deal with civilians and sometimes it's so nerve wracking just saying, man, just you've got to be able to hone it in and, and focus on what you need to do. How, how did you transition from? You, from that's a great, you gotta, great question. You said a keyword. I want to make sure I ground and land into that keyword, which is focus. That is the biggest, I would say that's one of the weaknesses of human beings is our, our capacity to focus. We are very poor focusing mechanisms, which is why we get distracted easily by different types of industries that are entertainment based, you know, distraction with the foot bones. Everybody's constantly in this like short attention span. Our ability to stay focused is really, really weak. So going into what you, you shared, how did I cope with that? Well, I, I get what you're saying, and there's nothing wrong with civilians because we all we chose to join the military to defend those that were or, or didn't want to do it, and there's nothing wrong with that. And you're right; it is. When I first got out um, and hearing the the same thing you're talking about, thinking, "Man, what a first world problem to hear you complain about your coffee not being as hot as you want it to be," um, or having like a, a you know your shower kind of went out for the night, or you know little nuances like that where. At first, after spending so much time in the desert and overseas and not having showers for some, sometimes 30, 45 days, um, you hear that and it does irk you because of your experience with the stress that that situation provided you. But then you stop. What, what happened was I, I realized, why am I giving credence to something so insignificant that really does not impact my life? Why am I getting angry in this moment, hearing this young kid or this woman or someone else talking about these little nuances that based on their worldview and perspective is in fact a, 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 an annoyance for them versus where we've been. And I started to realize that I don't want to operate where I give my energy to something that does not truly uplift who I am and does not add into my life. Um, and then I started to question the situations that are showing up for me. Is it important for me to have a conversation with that person if it's being directed at me or if it is impacting me. So I learned the key word of discernment at an early age. Where do I discern my focus? I stopped allowing myself to get, I would say, I don't even want to use that word triggered, but just kind of stimulated by these types of like complaints that we hear, you know, on a daily basis coming out of the military and, and realizing that's their life experience. They haven't seen what we've had. I cannot I cannot fault them or punish them for it. But if they turn it around and they start doing something where it affects me, I have no problem speaking up and, and confronting them in that moment to take that energy and move it away. But I'm not going to let that something be something that I assume so that I turn around and take it home into my household, affect maybe my wife or my dog or my friends or what it is I'm doing for the clients that I work with. So my coping tool was learning discernment. And then on that path of self-mastery, if you will, where I was focusing on making sure that I understood myself no matter the situation, it allowed me to just learn to ebb and flow and no longer cope with the stresses of war and coming home and dealing with people, but 
learn how to manage and utilize that for benefit. And if I needed to confront something, I'd confront it, but I would do it from a very balanced, grounded place. And if I needed to just take my focus elsewhere, I just did that and I did not allow it to overwhelm me because I found that, well, my purpose is over here. And if I just let every little you know, thing happen around me, bother me, then I'm literally no better than what it is I'm out here trying to change. So right. that's where I, that's, it's discernment. That's the key piece. Focus and discernment are very much a lacking skill in society right now. People do not know how to stay focused. And the ones that are really high achievers, they're so hell-bent and focused on more money and more growth that they actually don't know how to focus on relationships, their health and other areas. And that's why I do what I do is to get to those types of influential people and say, no more, it's time for you to be elite in all areas of your life. Yeah. Everything you've overlooked. And I'm going to optimize you quickly. And I'm going to get, I'm like a special ops guy. I'm going to come in your life, get you to the top of your game, keep you there. And then I'm going to get the hell out of your way. And you're going to go do what you got to do, but giving them the environment to experience those types of eruptions and see all of those elements they have not looked at. That's the key. So if they want to stop coping with their stress and learn how to utilize it and maximize its potential and find the value in the darkness and find the value in, in the chaos and bring it forth to their potential, then it's possible, but you got to be willing to do that too. Mm, great answer. Rick, the next tour yours. Yeah, I'm man. Probably. I mean, I'm just sitting here like, man, you know, you're speaking, speaking my language. You're speaking to me in different senses as well. You know, there was, um, I, I had a question for you, but when your last statement you made there where there's two types of people, people that are um, not trying to achieve, you know, not, not going after, sorry, I got distracted. Someone walked, one of my kids walked over here, but anyways, that uh, uh, being at home, that virtual world, right? Um, the type of people, yeah, right? <laughs> the type of people that are, you know, not necessarily going at the thing. They're allowing stressors in their life to, uh, or distractions in their life to keep them from being focused. You mentioned the cell phone. We, me and Marlon always talk about that with social media, things of that nature, not being able to focus. But then you have other people on the other end of the spectrum that are so focused on growth, so focused on goals, so focused on uh, 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 monetary growth and, 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 and things of that nature that they lose sight of the full picture themselves and what they, the, the full wholeness of life, right? And um, I mean, if I have a transparent moment with, you know, our travelers here, you know, me and Marlon, like we're learning every single week that we're doing these podcasts and we're trying to make sure that we internalize these things. And mm -hmm. it will be, it, for us to sit here and act like, yeah, we don't go through a lot of these different things as individuals as we're putting these things out because we're still growing as well. You know, I, I ended up in that bucket of, hey, I got these goals, you know, financially, I want to hit this mark. Uh, 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 career wise, I want to hit this mark. Uh, I want to grow this company. I want to do this. I want to do this. Boom, 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 boom. That I stopped focusing on the holistic life, right? And other areas in my life started to be, you know, um, suffer right. because I wasn't, I didn't pull back and have time to say, Hey, Rick, you know, it's great that you're going after these things, but these things are over here as are as same as important. And if you don't have that full balance right there, or that a, attention to the, the, the whole totality of life, right. Then right. you will suffer. In, in a sense, man. So I'm so I'm so grateful that you brought that up because a lot of people don't talk about that aspect of it. Yeah, that, that's grind, the grind, grind. Yeah, yeah that's not that I notice in, in in personal development, uh, especially working behind the scenes with some of the influencers and public figures in that industry for a few years. Yeah, uh, seeing the truth of what's really going on is they are hyping up, pitching, and selling you know these package systems and processes and events, etc. That promise you know, this unbelievably enlightened state of success where uh, if you look at it deeply, you realize they're teaching everybody how to make more money through systems. And then consequently, you might get to help some people. And it's it's a deeper intention of understanding that people are so pushed to make money first and just focus yeah. on their own growth and their own, that they're willing to sacrifice and suffer at all costs to accomplish that. And what they do is they end up getting caught up in this. I wrote a paper call. It's on my website too, at wileymcgraw.com called uh, Getting Help Versus Being Optimized and, and Why Leaders and High Achievers Are Wasting Our Life Chasing Peak Performance Instead of Mastering It. Part of that is because 
as young kids, we are, when we first zero to six, we have to learn and copy our adults around us. We mimic the environments we're in so we can start to develop ourselves, right? That's, that's the natural component. Uh, but when we get older, we don't really move far away from that. We tend to take that with us and we still try to copy and mimic other people we see creating certain types of success that we find value in, which is why we have society with the phones, et cetera, getting caught up in in these types of big name people who have got the money and the flashy lifestyle because they're living vicariously through them, thinking and feeling right. the energy of, I want that too. So let me, if I just do it their way, I'll get it. And they forget that totality of who they are and don't realize maybe you don't have the capacity to get to that level. Maybe you need to focus on the fact that your problems, and this is what I've discovered guys is, and I want your audience to really hear this part is most problems that we experience in our life the difficulties themselves do not lie within those problems. They lie elsewhere. Most yeah. of the time it is relationship dynamics that are dysfunctional mm. for health. It is past life experiences we've swept under the rug. It is yeah. complexity of every element of who we are other than just the problem that we might be facing in that moment. But what we do is we go online, we read a book, we hire a coach, we go to a seminar. We do a podcast. Find, oh, yeah. find, that, find that outside in solution hopefully to solve that said problem. And what they these people don't unfortunately do is get into the life of the person to truly see mm. their life as it's performing in real time because life is not a, a series of compartmentalized boxes. It is in fact holistically dynamic and life is constantly a mess moving around. So by being in with them in the trenches, you're able to really see maybe this thing over here is actually the reason why they're not making the money they want to make, but they keep trying to add a system to their, their business, a new strategy, a new CEO, a new this. And they're like, why are we still not really ah, where we want to be? But then we have most people that are caught up in the idea that performance is a measure based on how much money we can accumulate, how much we can grow and how many mm -hmm. people we exist. And what I've discovered is performance has everything to do with you in relationship to yourself, like you just said, in my life holistically. And I need to look at what areas am I sacrificing for the sake of this over here? What am I sweeping under the rug and not addressing head on? That could in fact be the reason why my success or results are not as optimal as I want them to be. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Uh, dude, man, you, you're speaking. So man, 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 I got to mute your mic, Marley, man. I, I, I have a feeling you're going to try to jump in there and ask another question. No, no. <laughs> I told you, you too. I'm a man of my word. I got integrity. <laughs> no, uh, Wiley, man, that is so, so profound, man, because, you know, you know, I, and you're speaking to me, man. You're, you, you are, you are speaking. If you're not speaking to any other traveler, I'm, I'm taking this one, travelers, you know, because, you know, I was the guy, you know, I'm listening to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to every motivational speaker, inspirational speaker, you know, going to the going to going to the conferences, and, and not to say anything's wrong with any of that stuff. It's all it's all great stuff. Um, but then you get to that point, like you said, where you know, one, and it goes back to a point that you made earlier that I really want to circle back to: doing things for others, right? So even in you know going to these different events, being in these different surroundings, you start finding yourself doing things to mimic what you, what perceived as going to be a success, success track for you. And then it kind of takes you away from who you are organically. And then when you don't make the same, the success or bear the same fruit as the individuals, then you start questioning yourself as to, oh man, what did I do right in this formula that they gave me versus reflecting on, like you said, pausing and reflecting on yourself as to, no, 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 no. You need to find out what Ricky needs to do. You need to find out what Marlon needs to do. You need to find out what Wiley needs to do. Yeah, principles are principles. Yes, they're applied in this world and you can take them and grab them, but how you apply them to your unique situation is gonna be completely different than the cookie cutter curriculum that someone gives you the take to, because it made them successful on their track. Right. And you find yourself in that cycle. So I would love for you to talk about, you know, share with our, 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 our travelers, just some don't even recognize that they're not even living the life that is for them, mm -hmm. but more so of the perceived 
area that they need to go, the baseball team they need to be on, the job they think they're supposed to be in, you know, how can they just give them some tools to just really pause just to reevaluate and make sure that they're on that track they need to be on? That's good. I will say um, it is, it's getting rid of the learning copy method with the start where, um, like you, you just said it a minute ago, there is nothing wrong with these. I, I see them as complementary. But if you don't have the ability to apply them, which most people don't, truly integrate them into your life and, and know how or see where you can pull the value from those, those seminars and books to accentuate you that really uplifts you. If you don't see yourself when you apply whatever it is you learn or whatever you read, if you don't experience your life expanding in the way that you desire it to expand, it's time to really take a step back to reflect on, it's almost like a self internal assessment on where and where you really want to go, where you should be, or what is actually standing in your way from your ability to apply or experience the growth that you want, because there's nothing wrong with goals. Absolutely have them. You want to make X amount of money and have this experience with your wife and kids and you want to have them, but don't get, I would say, bogged down by them as if they are like the anchor that you need to hold on to at all times. We get very rigid in our thinking that rigidity stems from fear. Fear is something you can't get rid of or should you ever even try to. You need fear to grow, but you have to learn how to, I would say, I would tell your travelers to learn how to embrace more of the fear of the unknown because when you step towards something that is really meant to change you and uplift you oftentimes it doesn't show up the way you might think it's going to show up or the way you think it should look it's not going to make you feel comfortable it's not going to even sound quote normal if you will and you might chalk it up half the time to your you know your gut telling you something's not right here not necessarily true most often than not, it's not always true. It's it's time for you to learn to discernment. And that's the key, I would say, as well as learn how to discern if a very uncomfortable, very, um, I would say, shocking situation or person shows up in your life in the time that you're wanting to do something better for yourself to evaluate why they're showing up, why it's in your life in that moment, discern whether or not there's value in it and then make a decision from there versus pushing it away because it feels very uncomfortable and it's not what you're used to or what you expect to show up. And I've met so many industry leaders over the years. Uh, I've met some, some public figures, some folks, some athletes as well that are so connected to the need to control the resources around them because they don't want to surrender and be vulnerable. So they end up hindering and limiting their power and potential when they could be accomplish, accomplishing so much more if they were willing to step towards those very things that they found scary and embrace them and let them in because that is exactly what they needed in that moment. So they, they bypass an opportunity. And despite all that, they create some amazing things, right? We've got athletes, these leaders, they are doing some unbelievable stuff. But imagine what you're going to be capable of when you can truly embrace and yield to the fear of the unknown when things are present in your life, when you can surrender the need to mimic or copy someone else who's done something for themselves and let go of this idea that I need to do it like they did because they were able to create it. What is it that I really want to see happen for myself? And let me take action towards those very things that can produce those results. And if it's not producing results, stop beating your head up against it and take a step back. Evaluate where your life is not really optimal. That's the key. Man. Okay. Now I can go. Yeah, now you can go, man. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, I, I'll tell you, I'm going to quote uh, a very profound author. His name is Biggie Smalls. Uh, he yeah. said, more money, more problems. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Amen. Cor- correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong. What I'm getting from you is that, and I see a lot of it in society, is somebody says, if I could just achieve that, I'll have happiness. Mm-hmm. And when they achieve that, they don't understand that that's not that that's really every time you achieve something, that doesn't mean you're going to no. ca- that's going to encapsulate the happiness that you want. That happiness is not something that you get just from achieving a thing. Mm-hmm. 
And because we're in society, we're so programmed to think if I get the car, the house, the mm-hmm. fine girl, and I have the money in the bank, I'm good. Mm-hmm. But then when they get to that level, what you're talking to those high level CEOs now, mm-hmm. and they're saying, man, there's something else that I'm looking for in my life. Right. So how do you how do you talk to those guys that have they have the money, they have everything, they're there, and you just want, and I know you went through it already, but I just want people to hear it mm-hmm. to say, stop thinking that happiness lies in the thing. How do you talk to these CEOs and level set them back and say, hey, this is what you guys need, or this is some of the areas that you need to grow in in order to accomplish that or try right. to gain that happiness? Yeah, brother, that, that's really good. Number one, it's, if you, <laughs> there's a, I remember it, um, I remember that if it was a Saturday Night Live skit with Adam Salary, <laughs> he says, if you're, who's the Italian, like a uh, tourist guide, and he says, if you're unhappy here, you're going to be unhappy over here. You know, he's talking to him. Mm. It's pretty funny. And it is true. I, I call it the Band-Aid on, on the bullet hole approach where you are trying to fill a void with things. Um, money, notoriety, uh, cars, clothes, all of those aspects are just material byproducts of your ability to achieve. That is, we can have high achievers get things done, make this money and be able to buy really nice things. But you cannot lie to yourself, despite what you might say on TV, on a segment, in an op-ed, or on a stage. You might say things are great, show like your life is great, but behind the scenes, when you're at home, you're miserable, you're suffering in silence and you're in pain because you might have a $100 million net worth. You might have a multi-billion dollar company you run. You might have the cars, the clothes, the travels, et cetera, the popularity, but you're still left feeling like you said, unresolved, something's still missing. What is next? What else do I need to do? Why do I not feel satisfied and at peace with my successes? And the people that come to me are done wasting away, trying to chase that sensation, that experience with everything they've accomplished. They realized I've overridden so much of myself to get here that I've basically burned all my bridges of my own life and I want to know what it is, it's going to take for me to finally put that all together so that I can experience that level of accomplishment for myself as a person, not the things I'm able to achieve. And there is a huge difference. And I'm going to say this and then go into that next part you would ask me about. Huge difference between being a high achiever and, and being a high performer. Mm. Understanding that achievement is your ability to stay on track and complete tasks and get things done in, in, in monument, or I would say as a result, you see things like money show up and, and you know new things uh, happen for your business or around you, et cetera. But high performance is all about how well you're living your life and the results you create are directly tied to how well you live your life. And the fact that we have people at the highest levels, doing what they're doing while still being angry, miserable, suffering in silence is absolutely a feat to the human, I would say, condition. But the flaw there is they are capable of so much more and they're just not giving themselves permission to put the ego aside and actually be willing to look at those things and realize that it's kind of like you're carrying around, you get this very well, a rucksack a 200 pound rucksack that we told you years ago to take off and you refused to do it. And now your body's so used to carrying that rucksack that the idea of taking it off sounds very painful and you push away anybody that tries to do it. However, by doing so, you'll actually be able to move quicker. You'll be able to get to where you want to go faster. You'll be able to experience a lot, much more uh, of relaxation in your body, less muscle strain, et cetera. You know how that goes. Yes. We don't, we don't value in our society the things like balance. Balance doesn't have drama and chaos. We thrive on that kind of energy. We feed on anger and every look what's going on in our culture right now with these wars and all this. nobody's talking and connecting and understanding from a very holistic dynamic place. People do not like balance. So leaders themselves are very, humans are very apt in, in masking their true intentions. So what I do with the types of clients that I work with, the types of leaders, public figures, et cetera, is I'm integrated into their life. I only work three, maybe four a year. It's very intimate. It's not a program. I'm involved in their life with them. I am like 
the battle buddy who's in the trenches 24 seven. And I'm the one who's radically like an operative going after every stone that has not been flipped over and we're getting it resolved and eradicated and the byproduct and the results are acceleration in their performance, acceleration in the results, more peace, more freedom, less fear, and all the ways in which they really dream about operating and just show up naturally because as human beings, we possess our own power and potential. But what suppresses it and stifles it is the ego and all the stress we carry around and all the pain we hold on to and the the forms of suffering that we create as human beings, and we do not allow ourselves to take that rucksack off. We just think we have to carry it because that's what being a human and being alive is all about is your scars make you who you are. And I call BS on that. Your scars are your life's experiences, but that you should never define yourself by those things. And until you can break free from that definition, you'll never truly know what freedom really feels like. You'll always be trying to grind towards the sensation, like you said, by buying the next beautiful toy. And I've worked with so many of those, those folks who've got the nice cars and the big bank accounts. And they're like, dude, this means nothing when my wife doesn't like me, my kids suffer. So yeah. at the end of the day, what do I do to solve that? Because I'm burned out. I'm at my wits end. I'm about to literally kill myself at this point. And I feel like I'm just a fraud after 30 years of doing this and being known for X, Y, Z. And when we finally address the real problems, the real rooted issues that they've been not looking at their entire life, it's amazing what transpires in the business world and their ability to actually rise to a level that's astronomical. So just to kind of close that out, it's, it's not even about talking to them. It's about getting in the trenches with them. It's about battling through it together, being really a, a true battle buddy through these types of life experiences that they need to actually deal with. And until you're able to do that with someone, you, you know, you're always going to scratch the surface and you're going to only be approaching it from this like outside in. And I, my work is focused on the inside out approach holistically with, the network of 40 plus specialists I, I, I have curated over the years across the entire field of human performance that work in tandem with me when I need them to, as life is happening for my client, because it's important for them to basically get their ass kicked in real time so they can be their best. That's what I, that's, that's how I talk to them, if you will. Man, I love it. Yeah. I love it, man. This is a great, Rick, this is a great conversation. People, if you're listening to this, rewind it, take out a pen. I don't know what you got to do, but these are some of the real conversations that we got to have because a lot of people just talk, they motivate those guys that are, oh, you're on the up and coming, you're up and coming, but nobody talks to that CEO that's in the freaking high rise that's sitting looking out of his window that he could overlook the whole city, but yet still he's like, oh man, oh. Uh. There is so much chaos behind the scenes with so many people. Uh, and that's why, again, the, I didn't share this earlier, but I will now is the, the privacy of the work that I do and why I don't talk about names and why is because it's part of the, the, the work that I do with them, the transformation that, that they are committing to is knowing the anonymity that they get to be very open and completely in a state of just unconditional vulnerability. And they get to expose their lives to, to someone like me, a resource like me that understands it, that gets in it with them, that I'm not outside of them trying to coach them you know, get up at 4 a.m., let's go run 10 miles, uh, motivate yourself. Those things have value, but that's not, you're just build, building more robotic, you know, systematized people that maybe they don't need to be getting up at four o'clock and doing a 10 mile run. You know, it's like, there's so much more complexity to each individual. And until we can address the individual of what's really going on within them, we're never really going to understand what they're capable of, what their fullest potential is. So people in these ivory towers are the biggest culprits. And then they're going to stand out in the world and they're going to dictate laws, rules, um, you know, policy, et cetera. They're going to be the ones that have the biggest impact and influence on people. And the result is what you see right now. We have massive dysfunction in our culture. We have wars going on uh, in communities. We have people that don't know how to have real conversation and leaders are just sitting up there in their high rise and they're talking big games from stages. But at the end of the day, it's all BS. That's it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And Wiley, man, this is this has been this has been great. This has been a grounding conversation, about, as I said before, even for myself. Um, and just the level of content, I I truly appreciate the position that you have taken in, in the in the world of really get going. You know, uh, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to find a military. Uh, a phrase to us, and she got both military. You know? uh, but you, you, you're going, uh, you going to battle. Let's just say you're going, you're going to battle, right? You're in the, you're in the, you're in the trenches. Trenches. There you go. You're in the trenches <laughs> with the individuals. Um, 
so that they could foster, you know, radical, identify and see radical change from within, not from ex external um, motivation, which of course is all, all those things are needed, inspiration, things of that nature, but- right. but, but separately, they're not enough. You no, know, they're not enough. They're not, not enough. enough. It's not something that's transferable. And that's that's the piece is it's, you know, people go to events and read books and they, they get what's called transference of energy. They don't actually have transformation of energy. And like you in, think about it, if we were in the trenches together, you're going to get more out of me keeping you in that challenge in that moment as that stress and all of those elements of you is, is bringing for, brought forth to the surface is erupting. That's kind of like the innate, you know, kind of thing that happens with me is, is my presence, my power, my focus, intention, everything simultaneously will erupt your underlying stresses. You can't hold it back. And when you have someone who's sitting there with you in it, who's feeling it with you, who's going through it with you. And then at the same time is providing you these powerful insights and directions, et cetera, based on all of this, this truth coming out, it's unbelievable how fast that stress actually resolves. It no longer is just something you have to relieve. It resolves. And the consequent result is more opportunity and effortlessly showing up more of your experience of peace and focus clarity. You start to see how you're able to show up and, 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 and crush your goals and it's unbelievable what happens, but we don't have resources that want to do that. It's, we have, you know, build coaching programs and try to get a thousand people into it and give them something right. that they can follow. And, and there's nothing wrong with those things, but if you want real transformation, you want to really be the most optimized version of you. You want to know what you're truly capable of and being elite in your own capacity of your life. You're not going to do it unless you have a resource that you, you cannot control. And that's going to challenge you and not let up on you. Something's like the military, right? We, Marine Corps, I, I, I almost joined the Marines, but it's same thing with combat and the infantry is like we go to these these trainings, not aware of what's going to happen to us. We don't know at all. We, there's a framework. We understand boot camp is X, but it does, we don't know what's going to happen there. We are yep. pushed to our brain 24 seven for months on end, emotionally, mentally, no sleep, lack of food, stress, pressure, everything, because it's designed to truly bring out our best in those real environments. Think about transferring that into personal development, leadership development in your high performance growth. That is why it's so important for me to bring this out to leaders is this is what it's gonna take. It's not about following a routine. I'm not getting you up at five. I'm not gonna make you do it X, Y, Z, even though that has value. It's really about you getting put into an environment that really challenges you and stretches your capacity to perform and really shows us what you're capable of. And one of the biggest life philosophies I live by, that I operate by. You guys have heard this, I'm sure. It was in the movie, The Matrix, and Anne Frank was actually coined to saying this is, you only truly know someone after you fight them. Is only tr then can you judge their real character. That is absolutely true across the board. People will hide and mask their intentions, their emotions, their feelings, their truth. But when you stretch them and you push them and you challenge them and you stir them up, and they yep. get everything heightened. They cannot hold back the truth. That's when you know who somebody is. That's when you know you got a friend. That's when you know you got a, a resource that's got your back all the way through the hell and, yeah. and back and, and not someone who's just there to collect a paycheck from you. If you don't have someone who's willing to shake you up to the point where you, you realize they're doing it because they love and care about you and want to see you succeed, you're, you're with the wrong resource. You need somebody new. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm telling you, an environment that really stretches you. Yeah. Not something that feels good and makes you excited about life because those those are fleeting feelings. I'm talking about, oh, man, that was heavy. But, man, I feel, you know, at the end of the day, I might be exhausted, tired, and I might have gone through the ringer, but whew, I feel like better I forgot. Yeah, yeah, better, better for it. And that's what society needs because right now we have so many people that are living the facade. And I'm talking about on all levels. I right. don't care if they work at Walmart, not disrespecting anybody that work at Walmart, no. but. I don't care if they're working at Walmart. There's a facade that some the guy at Walmart, the guy at Walmart is trying to portray that he's the guy that works um, the, the 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 corporate level. The guy that's at the corporate level is trying to portray that he's the guy that owns a company. The guy that owns a company is trying to portray that he's the billionaire. And the guy that's the billionaire is trying to put he's the he's the guy that can and it keeps on just going and it's just like it festers and people and I just see a lot of. And you know I think that's why we have a lot starts. of problems. You, you know where that starts. And it's it's not it's not like the Reagan theory of trickle-down economics. It truly is, in fact, 
the energetics of dynamics when you have your leaders that do that. Consequently, the people that follow them that they have impact on. Are the That's why, again, my, my business was built around my understanding of my power and capacity, my gift. It's something I didn't learn from someone else. I didn't follow another guru to figure it out. It was discovering in my life experiences who those were my biggest mentors that helped me discover myself. And then building this business around it, realizing I was built and meant to be in the trenches with these high caliber people because of the capacity and my intensity and my ability to see and do what I do. That's my job. So I understand that. And that's why I go after these leaders because when we get a leader an influencer, whatever title we want to give them. I, I hate getting stuck on labels, but whatever title yeah. we want to give them. These people have influence, massive influence and power on every aspect of our lives. They need to be the most optimized, most balanced, healthiest version of them. And until they are, we're always going to have that kind of, like you said, that attitude where I, they, people are acting like something they're not. And we have a society that just lives in this dysfunction. And then we start rewarding it. And nobody stands up and says, enough. We need to start rewarding people who are living lives from a place of standards, from a place of discipline, from a place of balance, from a place of integrity, from people who were uplifting others, not from whoever's got the loudest mouth, whoever can yell the most, who can ever fight the best. All of that in this culture is just broken. And it starts truly with leadership, politicians, CEOs, public figures, these big name uh, media uh, entities, et cetera, so forth, all of it. Get them to their place and watch what trickles down in effects. Man. Woo! Well, travelers, man, we we, we got to get out of here. But, uh, man, uh, Wiley, before we go, please share again. I know you mentioned it a couple of times uh, um, throughout the show, but where they can find you, um, resources that you have, they can, they can tap into. Um, Maybe even a conference you have they can come to, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I love is uh, I'm I'm being asked to I'm getting groomed right now for a TED uh, a TEDx talk, so that's another. Nice. Mm. But um, I'm always happy to have conversations. Uh, I got asked to come speak at a, a mastermind, which I'm going to go do. Which I, I love just connecting with people and providing, I would say, challenging insights that make people think differently about themselves, their performance, and what they're capable of. So I like the refreshing aspect of you know, what's, you know, the abnormal, if you will, based on what, what everybody talks about nowadays in the coaching world. So uh, WileyMcGraw.com is the website we put together after, man, being in the shadows for a long time. Um, but everything there, I have a couple papers I wrote about, uh, like I said, helping versus uh, uh, optimizing, getting helped versus being optimized. I have another one, why you need to get un-effed. Uh, you know, I don't want to you know, scream that out loud here, but um, <laughs> it's understanding like you know, these two elements of, of true human performance. People can read those papers. I have, uh, I've been interviewed by uh, Authority Magazine on the nature of my work. So people can grab really good insights out of that as well. Forbes. Uh, and I actually just uh, co-authored a, a chapter in a book about peak performance, mindset tools for business. It's on my website. They can download my chapter for free uh, and read about yielding to the fear of the unknown and breaking it down what we talked about today, guys, they can learn about that as well. And I'm, you know, that they want to follow up and just have conversations or pay attention when I start this campaign of other uh, unbelievable content is uh, linkedin.com forward slash Wiley McGraw. And uh, I think we're building out some other social media stuff as well. So stay tuned for all that. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Love it. Hey guys, man, travelers, we really appreciate you guys again for just coming and being here with us today. Um, Wiley, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for spending yeah. some time with us and just sharing your, your story, you know, from, from a baseball player to a bull rider to uh, jumping out of airplanes in the military, leading uh, uh, troops uh, to now leading people to really identify where they need, to, where they can grow, where they can improve, where they identify ways to really uh, grow uh, themselves and their performance. So, man, I told you guys from the very beginning, it's going to be a dynamic, dynamic uh, interview because of this dynamic background that Wiley has. And again, Wiley, we want to thank you. And to all of our listeners, we thank you. Uh, don't forget to check us out on the successjourneyshow.com, uh, on all podcast platforms, uh, also on YouTube, as well as uh, internet radio as iHeart21, the net, point six, the net, uh, and, and a couple more to come, actually. We've had, yeah. had um, sparked up a few. Yeah, sparked up a, a few 
more. So, um, yeah, guys, we're, we're growing. We're having a great time sharing these stories with you. And we're having a great time spending some time with our guests. So uh, we'll see you guys again next week at the same time, at the same place on a success journey show. Everyone have a good one, please. One love. You've been listening to the Success Journey Show, where your dreams, drive, determination, and diligence are the foundation to success. For more information, check out thesuccessjourneyshow.com. The Journey Squad is here helping you to your destination. 